And if it's like a good man now, I am a queer, non-binary, feminist writer, editor, poet. My pronouns are they and them. And I cannot tell you today how incredibly honored I am to be on a panel of such luminaries and thinkers. I'm excited for the conversation that we're going to have tonight. Um, I want it to be as generative um, as possible. Um, I don't want us to feel bogged down by the pandemic situation. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I probably will start off with a little bit of housekeeping um, and then I'll invite Richard Patel to come up and introduce our esteemed speaker for today. Um, but before we begin, please make sure that your cell phones are on silent. Um, as well as, what's, what's another house rule? I think that's the one that's the most important. Um, we'll be beginning with um, a lecture by Ruth Wilson Gilmore for about <laughs> 25 minutes, and then um, give our panelists, our steam panelists, a chance to respond. I'm thinking about 10 minutes. Uh, while we were sitting over there, Dr. Kelly Gillespie was asking, um, is it possible um, if we are allowed to ask Ruthie questions during our 10 minutes? And I say, absolutely. Um, I, they shouldn't be stodgy uh, conversations. We are trying to be as deeply anti-colonial as possible here um, and as, as, as generative and as free as, as we can be under the current conditions. Um, and with that, I think I will start, I will invite, I think, let me invite um, Dr. Richard Pitas to come through and do the introduction, and then without further ado, we can get started. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Good evening. Good evening. It's really wonderful to have um, all these people here and to have this electric energy in the room. Molela asked me to do two things quickly. One is to say something about the space and the project that it is, and the other is to say something about this evening and the significance of, of what's happening <laughs> here. The Forge was created with the aspiration to create a space in which people from different, different kinds of social locations, people with different experiences, with different ideas, could connect and meet and learn from each other and en enrich each other. The hope, the hope was that this could be a generative space that enriches everybody. Uh, we don't want a kind of space where people show off their theoretical dexterity and the fancy words they learn. We don't want a space where people are settling their scores with each other. We want to learn we want to grow and we want to do that together because there are real struggles that need to be fought. And it's not just about having the right posture. We need to start winning things. Mm. We've had some wonderful events here. But we also meet every time under the shadow of the realities that we confront in this country. On the 15th of June this year, just before you came, <coughs> we had a talk, uh, a panel like this, there's a young man sitting, sitting here, I think in the same chair that Ruth is sitting now, uh, he spoke about his vision for socialism. He is not just an intellectual abstracted from the real world, he was a participant in an incredibly courageous and tenacious struggle to build a commune, a site of collectivity and democracy and mutual respect in one of the most intense sites of abandonment around, one of the most violent sites, you know, violent from the state and from all other actors. And he was part of a group of people that achieved remarkable things. There's a beautiful photograph of him there in the foyer taken by Mufundo Koro. He said when he was sitting here that he did not think he would live for much longer that he had made a choice to commit himself to socialism or death. And that was the 15th of June. On the 8th of August, he was assassinated in Germany. So there's a heaviness and a seriousness. We, we have to take that on in, in, in full. And I think 
That doesn't mean we don't have joy and, and we don't feel nurtured and, and strengthened by being together. But the topic that we're talking about tonight, about organized abandonment, goes to the heart of the crisis in our country. It's not by a lack or a delay that most people in our country are impoverished and live very difficult lives. Um, the idea that when the state comes, things will be resolved, that the problem is the absence of the state, really has to be thought about very carefully. Because when the state does come, it often comes with guns. It's often coming to ensure that that abandonment is sustained. When other people come with guns, like the assassins that killed in the bush here, the state does not, as a rule, come to put that right. In that particular case, the two men that assassinated him were filmed. There's video footage of them. The police have that video footage. They don't make an arrest. This abandonment of the majority of our people is an expression of a system of oppression. And what we are hoping is that conversations in this place can help us to build our strength to, to fight that. I know people know who Ruthie Wilson Gilmore is. When Wolela asked me to say something, it was on the 6th of December, which is the anniversary of Fanon's death, the radical doctor and psychiatrist and journalist from the Caribbean who fought in the war for national liberation in Algeria. People like to talk about the first couple of lines of his last book, The Wretched of the Earth, which are about the city and the settler colony. And that city, uh, he describes as a world cut into two. They don't speak a lot about the end of that book, the last lines that he gives us, where he's dying when he writes this. In fact, he was dictating from a mattress on the floor of a flat in Tunis. He says, we have to work out new concepts. That's what he left us with. And what I found so incredibly enriching about Ruthie's work, whether you're reading papers or books, or whether you are listening to podcasts or, or watching films, it's just this, this brimming, flowing river of concepts. These precisely worked out ideas that come one after the other, that help us to understand how our world came to be, how it is, better than we did, help us to understand how it's changing, why it's changing, in whose interest it's changing, and how we can change it. That kind of intellectual labor is not just a performance of a prodigious intelligence. It comes out of struggle, as everyone on this panel does. It speaks to struggle, it speaks across struggle, and it makes us, it makes us stronger. It's going to be a wonderful discussion. You are all most welcome, and uh, let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you so much. Sorry for the screech. <laughs> um, I have been tasked <laughs> with uh, um, the job of introducing our incredible panelists, um, but I, I think bios are fantastic in the sense that they are succinct. <laughs> um, so I'll just do that. I'll start with reading um, our, our biographies, um, and then I'll just hand it over to you, because I think I really want to get into it. So, on the other end of there, we have Professor Kelly Gillespie from the University of the Western Cape. Um, she is a political and legal anthropologist with a research focus on criminal justice in <coughs> South Africa. Then we have um, Asi Von Fils, who is the co-director of operations here at The Forge. Um, if you're not hearing um, that then will allow open up um, one of the discussions or the, or, um, or the book launches. It's usually um, everyone's incredible face. So it's wonderful to have you here and to hear you speak as a thinker. 
Um, and then right next to me is Dr. Bashna Jagana. Um, and she's a director of Pan African Today and Friends of the Workers. And here we go, our guest of honor, um, Professor Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Ruth Wilson Gilmore is Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences and Director of the Center for Place, Culture and Politics at the City University of New York Graduate Center. She co-founded grassroots organizations, including California Prison Moratorium Project, Critical Resistance, and the Central California Environmental Justice Network. Her work on labor and social movements arises from the urgencies of organized violence, organized abandonment, and building abolition as a green, red, and internationalist project of liberation. She's author of Abolition Geography, Essays Towards Liberation, the book that you see scattered all over here. It's fantastic, so good. Um, Golden Gulag, Prison, Surplus, Crisis, and Opposition in Globalizing California. And she's co-edited with Paul Gilroy, Stuart Hall, Selected Writings on Race and Difference. And with that, I'm going to give it over to uh, Ruthie to open it up. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Hi. How's everybody? Good. Good, good. I am I'm so delighted and honored and nervous and thrilled to be here with everybody tonight. I feel the heaviness of responsibility for our fallen comrades. Richard talked about one, but we all know there are so many. And I want to preface my remarks by saying, in case anybody wonders, that what brought many of us, including Comrade Kelly, many people around the world to abolition, was not because we decided to ignore harm and violence, but rather because we're tired of it. We came to abolition because we were tired of lo losing loved ones to violence, whether police violence or thug violence made no difference. We were tired of people being afraid of their vulnerability to rape and other forms of people's expression through violence of the right to rule us tired. So we became abolitionists in order to realize the promise and necessity of socialism from the ground up, or as our fallen colleague, comrade put it so beautifully, socialism or death socialism or death. So that is the preface to my remarks, and I will try to stick to the 23 and a half minutes I have left, okay. but I might stray. All right, <clears throat> so this book called Abolition Geography. Abolition Geography starts from the very simple premise that freedom is a place. That means where life is precious, life is precious. Abolition then is not absence, but presence. So Richard spoke briefly about the various ways that I, working closely with many comrades and many struggles, have tried to um, develop concepts that we can use. And I turn to the brilliant historian and novelist China Mayville for a sentence that beautifully summarizes what we're trying to do. He wrote, we were trying to find language to make sense of a time before whatever came after. Find language to make sense of a time before whatever came after. So we are in the before. So it's not looking backward, but looking ahead. And this is what abolition and then organized abandonment, as I will discuss briefly, try to do. So let me start with two episodes of my recent uh, astonishing uh, encounters here in South Africa, just to have images in our heads. 
One is that Comrade Kelly took me to visit a place called Philippi Village. Um, and Philippi Village is in the middle of a settlement. Uh, it's uh, a place that has had a pretty significant infusion of money resources to make possible uh, the development of certain kinds of community activities toward the goal of self-determination, not unlike the forge. Different kind of donor, different kind of structure, but not unlike uh, the forge in its presence. The location of this new facility, relatively new facility, was a cement factory during apartheid. Now cement is one of the principal materials used to build the world, right? The number one item extracted and moved around the planet to remake the surface of the world is sand. And it goes into two things in particular, concrete or cement and glass. And between cement and glass, we can get a sense of the world, not only the street and the windows, but also the you know, various communication devices that we all use, you know, include that sand that is extracted and moved around the world. In post-apartheid South Africa, the white capitalists who owned that factory left it, and it became a hulk of inactivity. Instead of becoming a center of new activity, whether to make cement or something else to build the country after apartheid. So that's the first thing, the cement factory, which is now, again, not a cement factory, but a place that is struggling to be a center for people to come together to make the world they want and need. The second episode is one that happened just two days ago. I went with comrades to visit two um, communities uh, not far from here, two villages, and I think there are comrades here that I visited with, yes? yes. Hey, hey, it's good to see you again. And while we were there, visiting with each other, I was learning about the struggles and also the uh, accomplishments of comrades in the villages. Uh, three comrades from another brand new, brand new, like minutes old occupation. Is anyone there here from that occupation? I can't see. They came hoping, desperate, to find answers to their immediate vulnerability, which was, of course, eviction. Because they had just arrived. And one of the things I discussed with the comrades toward the end of my visit was uh, the documents they had gotten their hands on that showed who owned the land they were occupying. They had pooled their resources and gone to the notarial office and gotten the record of the recent sale of that land from an old apartheid farm I think it's called Allendale, to the province. Gauteng province owns this land, which was bought this year, in 2022, for 108 million rent. This is the land our comrades are trying to occupy so they can build homes and have lives. The province has already determined which suppliers will bring electricity, we can talk about that later, and gas to this area. So there were 10 or 12 pages of evidence that our comrades didn't know what to make of, nor did we, actually, who were discussing things with them. But it was something, something. It was something that showed us, as so many other things show us, what organized abandonment is. That deed of sale is an indication of organized abandonment. Because, of course, when the province determined to buy that land, it was not a mystery, it was not unknown, 
to the Provincial Land Acquisition Agency how many, 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 many people need a place to live and it is at the end of the day, no matter what the struggle, all about land. Organized abandonment exploits inequality and deepens it. Now, abandonment itself seems self-explanatory. Individuals, households, communities, workers, entire industrial sectors, manufacturing, agricultural, and other capacities are cut loose and locked in or locked out. But I suggest that the organized part of organized abandonment is where maybe we should put our energy and focus. That organized part sharpens our awareness of how abandonment results from plans as well as abdications of responsibility, right? So it's not merely a withdrawal, but it's a plan. Organized helps us analyze why things happen by seeing how, in order to identify possible contradictions to, uh, uh, to counter-exploit, in order to shift the ground of the future's historical geography, which is to say to shift what's happening before whatever comes after. It is not a mystery to anyone in this room that inequality on a world scale is particular in different places, but it is a global phenomenon. And its particularities have visible and invisible effects in various localities, states, regions, urban and rural areas, including the great in-between, where I think actually a lot of the people who are counted officially as urban live. Um, there's a melee word for it, desakota. It's not urban or rural. It's that great in-between. Um, the sectors uh, where inequality is very deep include agriculture, industrial, service, and extractive work. And they're all features of capitalism, saving capitalism from capitalism. Capitalism, saving capitalism from capitalism. That's what brings us here tonight. And those features give specific form to the struggles of the planet's eight million denizens as they, which is to say we struggle, to move around or stay put. And that is kind of the human condition, that we're trying to either stay or go. And in both cases, there are barriers. Organized violence secures boundaries, or what I often call partitions, that are hardened by bureaucracies, by cops, by militaries, by militias, by thugs. Effectively, then, any effort, analytical effort, to, um, you know the word triage? To say, okay, these are the people who count and these are the people who won't, which in hospital means these are the people who might live and these are the ones who will die. That's the battlefield triage. These we can maybe save, these we can't. So triage is a problem of political economic analysis. And it is one that has built into it a tendency to decide before thinking that some people actually can't be saved. And I reject that, and I think the entire panel and everyone in this room rejects it too. But this triage of political economic struggle uh, attempts to identify some true subjects of history, and it is a fatally crude calculus. In fact, it's a murderous one. That's because the forces of criminalization and the forces of denationalization constantly create the appearance, which is refreshed by human sacrifice, that some of us are external to capitalism or to nation or to development or to deserving, rather than that all of us are the vital energy 
or when we organize the vital obstacles. These then are people who in an earlier period might have been called lumpen. I propose there are no lumpen anymore. So this effort to make a determination and therefore ignore so many aspects of organized violence misrecognizes class composition and therefore analytically diminishes what in fact cannot be dismissed or domesticated, which is the relentless enforcement of inequality on a world scale. It can't be domesticated. That is a way of saying the police cannot be reformed. They will never be domesticated. And it's not because every individual is a bad person. It's because structurally, they cannot be reformed. How could they be? The militaries cannot be reformed. How could they be? All right. uh, domesticated. All right. So what cannot be dismissed or domesticated is the relentless enforcement of inequality. Thus, the violently secured partitions make the resources necessary for social reproduction hard to come by. Land, water, food, healthcare, education, wages, and joy. And this is what we were discussing um, on Tuesday in our long, wonderful uh, conversations uh, in, in communities. This is what people are discussing when I was in Cape Town. This is what people are discussing everywhere I go everywhere I go. So it's not me carrying an idea that drops onto the floor, but this idea comes up from the ground and I'm here to share it. These partitions secure boundaries that however can move. Right? I mean, as one brother said the other day, uh, we're now being murdered by black people here where we once were murdered by white people. Right? The partitions can move but they're still partitions. These partitions actually outline class composition and should consign to the dustbin the notion that some people are history's victims rather than what the lens of abolition brings into sharp focus, the variety and abundance of history's protagonists. Protagonists I can't read my own writing. Protagonists <laughs> 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 do something that's really important. I just can't read my writing to tell you what it is. Protagonists mobilize for many reasons. And I emphasize that word, reasons. Even if the expression of those reasons sounds raw and like feelings, rage, despair, frustration. We can see and we can hear and feel this too, everywhere. Cadres matter. Cadres recognize and help crystallize the political shape of feelings. Not by dictating, but rather encouraging campaigns that start from where people are at. The motion passing through a provisional analysis of some aspect of the organized in organized abandonment moves from complaint, which is urgently needed to identify needs and goals, to grassroots planning, to rehearsing, which is to say embodying in a community of protagonists the motion toward change that will provisionally change the possibilities to make freedom as a place, whether that place is a mine, a home, a migration path, a field, bodily integrity, all of these kinds of places. So people make plans based on understanding of why and how things happen where they do. By examining the dramatic features of organized abandonment, history's protagonists figure out how to create capacity, which is to say make power. So create capacity means make power to gain provisional goals. 
consciousness, and this is straight out of one of my key mentors in the uh, black radical tradition who's written about it, Cedric Robinson. And those of you who have come up through the black consciousness movement here in South Africa know better than I what I'm talking about. Consciousness both guides and is reworked by action. In other words, joy mixing, uh, excuse me, in other words, through joyfully mixing our labor with the earth, we change the external world and thereby change our own nature. Or to cite W.E.B. Du Bois in a piece he wrote in 1933, whose words Thomas Sankara echoed decades later, history's protagonists become insane with courage. Insane with courage. Insane here isn't reckless or ableist, except in the sense of refusing every reason secured by the forces of organized violence that propose the social order cannot change due to impossible demands. For the impossible to become possible is the art of abolition and also its craft. Even if most practitioners don't call themselves abolitionists, the impossible is realized as and through creative aggression. Creative aggression. So I'm almost done. How am I doing? Pretty well. Okay. So thinking further, creative aggression invites us to pull back and notice patterns, both to enable pursuit of immediate and medium term goals and turning our vision leftward to see possible combinations across time, space, and sector that can become concentrated energy. And for me, solidarity is that, concentrated energy. And I can give some examples when we get to Q&A of what I mean. Well, I'll give one now. And that is the relationship of Abal Lali and the MST is, is an example of seeing uh, patterns that make the capacity to concentrate energy across such a distance between people who are so lightly resourced when it comes to cash money and so intensely resourced when it comes to consciousness and political will. Consciousness and political will. So a number of possible opportunities you know, have come to mind as I've been talking with comrades over the last few days, and these are things that we might discuss if there's time. I mean, for example, uh, while visiting an occupation in Cape Town, that a uh, building that used to be a hospital, so I talked about a cement factory that no longer makes cement, a hospital that no longer tends to the suffering and ill. That place, uh, Sissy Gould House, has been a uh, home now to, what, a thousand people. Uh, it's an occupation. And while Comrade Kelly and I and Comrade Craig and others were there the other day, um, we had a, the chance to talk to a gentleman, a comrade who is a retired architect. <coughs> and he explained to us not only what the structure of the various kinds of housing that had been promised by the post-apartheid government and very um, uh, weakly uh, realized by the government after the first two years, but also talked about how a building such as a hospital could be effectively transformed into uh, secure and uh, infrastructurally appropriate dwelling quarters for people to live in a variety of different kinds of configurations. So a two-bedroom apartment for a, a family or more communal housing for people who want to live communally and other kinds of, of arrangements. So this architect could see, because he knew how to design hospitals and shopping malls, country is lousy with shopping malls, is it not? He could see how he could make the transformation. Rather than accede to the provinces or the 
the municipalities um, idea that they would just knock the hospital down and build something new because you know it would never happen that way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It would never happen that way and the hospital could be transformed. So it occurred to me that this country probably has a dozen retired architects who have this kind of knowledge, who could be summoned to bring their wisdom and understanding on an ad hoc basis to various kinds of problems. They don't have to become part of you know, a, an organization, become a part of a cadre, except for the on-call cadre of retired architects. Same with engineers, same with others, who, who know how to solve problems that people can see and, and, and identify and understand. Another is um, a system of, uh, of clinics that could uh, readily um, um, be realized according to patterns already uh, achieved with, again, very low money resources um, by nurses in, throughout rural Nigeria, for example. And I understand there's also a pattern here um, that uh, existed under apartheid and may well have um, survived the end of apartheid, which is a strange thing to say, but I said it. Um, there are other, other campaigns, and one that I thought to, to bring to mind before I close is um, uh, Richard started us off, Comrade Richard started us, us off talking about our fallen comrade, and we have on the, on the window here of the forge the names of many fallen comrades. Some years ago, when I was visiting, I think I was in Lebanon, um, uh, the Israeli forces, I don't know, Mossad or whoever, their agents, had uh, assassinated uh, a major actor in Hezbollah who had been living, he thought, quietly in, um, I think he was assassinated in Damascus. The day I arrived, which was within 12 hours of the death of this person, there were posters, big posters, on all of the street, street, uh, pole, street light poles throughout um, vast areas of Beirut. Now that takes money, so it's not something somebody can do uh, thoughtlessly and without resources. But it does bring to mind some of the kind of grassroots ways that people work hard, not only to lift the names of martyrs, but also to lift the names of people who may not be kind of officially in the political sphere of martyrs, who nonetheless have been the victims of human sacrifice whose names must also be said. So if there's somebody here, it, um, perhaps students who are looking for something to do, it could be that starting a Say Their Name campaign could help to shine light on the brutality of the police and the addictions and the red ants and law enforcement and all of these other forces of organized violence in order to help shift consciousness away from the notion that if only we could draw a partition between those who are innocent and those who are not, then we can deploy the police where they should be brutal and let the rest of us get on with our lives. Because I understand that that is a difficult, a difficult, difficult mountain to climb in conditions where people are vulnerable to harm, vulnerable to violence, vulnerable to premature death at the hands of another. And so many people use violence as speech these days. Mm -hmm. My mother was beat up and robbed in front of her house when she was, I'm 72, she was probably like 78 when it happened. It took me a long time to talk to my parents about how more police was not going to end the problem of thugs coming and beating up a little old lady on her front step. But I did. I did. So let me close. And I'm, pardon me, I have to read this off my phone. So the lights went out um, while I was preparing. And uh, I couldn't quite I write you. everything <laughs> <laughs> into, my, into my notebook, which is 
a little backward, but there you have it. Okay. So this is the very shortest thing. And this is for this is for you, comrade. No. Okay. It's called We Want the State. And about 100 years ago, maybe 102 years ago, somebody asked Lenin, well, how are you going to secure this revolution? And he said, the Soviets plus electricity. The Soviets plus electricity. Now here in South Africa, electricity is on everyone's mind every day, whether people live where there is interrupted service or people live where there is no service. What was Lenin saying? I can't even read my phone. What, he, what was Lenin saying? To me, he was talking about two kinds of energy, and also the particular and general forms of organization necessary to live the change promised in the revolution, to continue to rehearse it, not to become perfect, but to make society aware of itself as society, and therefore as something we make and maintain in relation to one another and the environment. So, one kind of energy, Lenin was talking about in my view, is the self-organized and self-governing Soviets, or the committees and the communities in um, the informal settlements, or the unions that are practicing democratic self-government while going to, um, uh, in, to battle against the capital and state. So Lenin was talking about that kind of energy. It's varied, it's not identical. It's based in particularities, yet oriented toward combining with the general. And that's the key, oriented toward combining with the general. And that other kind of energy, electricity, powering the possibilities envisioned, envisioned, built, and revised by history's protagonists who persistently make the world through creative aggression. If freedom is a place, it's shaped not only by struggle, it's also shaped by the purposeful effort, as I mentioned earlier, of making and feeling joy. When Cabral spoke at the Tricontinental Gathering in Cuba, he emphasized what he called the gut joy of being with comrades who were making revolution there and elsewhere. And on Tuesday this week, when I was out with comrades in the village, I experienced gut joy many times over by being welcomed, by being in conversation with comrades, by learning about struggles, and also by listening to choirs and watching dancers and feeling joy with the packed room of spectators. Freedom is a place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruthie. There's so much to think about and so much to chew, and I'm glad that I have incredible masticators up here <laughs> with me yes, so that we can chew. A so real word is really chew, chew, you know? um, I'm, I'm, I'm really taken by um, your insistence and your rework of W.E. Du Bois and with this notion that history's protagonists become insane with courage. As a segue to get um, to Dr. Gillespie, I'd like to kind of share a passage, um, also connected to this idea, this very striking image of the cement factory in Philippi that is, that is empty, and also uh, as a way of positioning myself um, about how we met, <laughs> um, which is deeply connected to um, one, a, a protagonist that I'm very, very lucky to call friend and family, uh, Kenny Gillespie, so I'll, I'll share this piece first that I was lucky to share with you um, at the reading group um, where we were encountering your work. And this is from a piece called Making Love and Putting on Obscene Plays and Poetry Outside the Empty Former Prisons by Andrea Abikaran and Kay Gabriel. Um, they write, we are writing at a juncture of crisis, of long-standing roots and rapid progression deeply embedded in economy and ecology and probably felt at the level of everyday life. We're also writing in a moment of revivified theory and practice against capital and empire. 
characterized by widespread strikes and insurrections, an international prison abolitionist movement, the legacies of Occupy and Black Lives Matter, anti-pipeline blockades led by indigenous water and land protectors at Standing Rock and Wet'suwet'en, the rediscovery by the queer and trans left of the anti-capitalist and anti-colonial politics of the gay liberation era, revitalized labor militancy, red strikes, housing occupations, anti-fascist mobilizations, the rapid expansion of mutual aid networks and still exhilaratingly more. I think the exhilaration that, is, that Kay um, and Andrea speak about here is connected to that gut joy. And the first time I experienced that was as a baby activist and as a baby poet at Constitutional Hill, which is also an interesting, and I would love to hear more about your thoughts about a space that used to be that has such a haunted history and now has a different history, but now is perhaps co-opted by an anti-state state. state. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think just with that, I'll give over to Dr. Kelly Gillespie to respond um, and kick off this discussion. You want me to begin? Yes, please. Okay. I'm so happy to be here. Um, really thrilled. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all for being here. This is the most amazing crowd, the kind that Joburg turns out. So thank you for coming and thank you, Lizzie. Um, so I have about 25 points and questions <laughs> written down here, but I'm going to try and maybe do two of them. Um, so I think just to begin, I, I want us to reflect on how um, when Ruth is speaking about abolition, did you notice how little she spoke about prisons and police? And I think, you know, I think many of us assume when we hear the word abolition, when we hear the term abolition, we think abolitionists just want to tear down prisons and police and then will somehow, abolitionists somehow think everything will be fixed. But I want us to pause and notice in Ruthie's presentation how that was maybe a fraction of what she spoke about in reflecting on this evening. I think it's really important for us to think why that is. <coughs> Did you all notice that? Okay, so, so I think the first thing to say about that is that um, in you know, Ruthie's organizing in Southern California in the 1990, 1990s, 2000s. She begins writing about prisons because prisons are the symptom of a whole set of processes that are going on in what we could call neoliberalism California. So it's not that prisons become the central focus of abolition because, uh, you know, Abolitionists think prisons and, and police are a bad idea. It's because the way, and Golden Gulag's, uh, Ruthie's first book does this so brilliantly, shows how the rearrangement of state and capital in 1990s California makes prisons appear as if they're going to fix the problem of surplus or the problem of the rearrangement of capital and statecraft such that prisons then become built, you know, prisons are being built, you know, massive swathes of concrete get poured for the building of prisons as opposed to the building of schools, right, or the building of housing. So prisons become a fix, a kind of neoliberal fix for a problem of state and capital. So this, is, in a sense, they're the symptom in much the same way that you know, when the problem of mass evictions um, off of land and housing that is going on all over this country and in many parts of the world starts happening, the fix that seems to be most appropriate for contemporary capital and statecraft in this country is to send in law enforcement, the red ants, etc., to evict, to fix. But the beginnings of that problem are not the police and the securitization. The beginnings of the problem are 
the processes of capital and state that are creating the conditions for that fix to seem like something that can solve the problem. So in Ruthie's articulation of what abolition is, right, in an, the abolitionist reading, at the heart of it is the problem of organized abandonment. The heart of it is not the problem with police and prisons. They become symptoms to, that, that seem like the best way to fix the problem of organized abandonment. Right? Well, they become the organized violence that appears to fix the problem of organized abandonment. So what, and what I love, Ruthie, and what you offer us with such acuity and with such um, precision in your concepts is to, uh, is to force us to go back to what's at stake in the crux of the problem and to point our attention to the new and old forms of abandonment that are really at the heart of the problem here. So in a sense, we can talk about police, we can talk about prisons, but at the heart of the problem is the problem of, of organized abandonment, of who gets to die and who gets to live, of who gets saved and who does not get saved in the calculus of our political uh, society. And that's something that we know all about here. Mm -hmm. But what I also love about that way of framing the problem and the way of drilling down to conceptualize the problem is that what also becomes clear is, and what also becomes, what also gets opened for us in that diagnostic is how we might attend to the problem. And so what I've been really appreciating about not only your, your, your writing, but also your talking, is how, how you're asking us to look for politics in what you call anti-abandonment organization. <laughs> where, where is the work against organized abandonment happening? Where do we see it? And what unusual and interesting forms of politics can we find in those places that we might not anticipate finding politics? And so where are people attending to the work of revaluing that which has been devalued? Of, of, alloc of attributing value to that which our fucked up, messed up society, which is so deeply entrenched in the processes of organized abandonment, where people are retrieving a politics. We're saying we, we value, we want to value, we want to work and organize to value that which has been devalued, right? To flip. And that, all of a sudden, opens onto a whole new set of possibility for political organization, right? It's not only unions. It's also, it's also people who are cooking for people who don't have food, right? It's also, um, people who are investing heavily in the work of after-school programs for kids who would otherwise be subjected to organized violence of one form or another. It's the work of insisting that our work must be in service of that flip in value, that shift, that insistence that we take responsibility in all of our work, in all of our organizing, in all of our daily, daily energy to work and push against the logic of organized abandonment. Mm. To think where do we do the work of anti-abandonment? Mm. So I, I really value this as a way of phrasing the effort of political work in this current, in our, in our current um, world. But what's also so important to me, and you just tell me to shut up because I've got my, I'm, I've chosen two points, but you know I could, okay. <laughs> what's also so important is that, um, and you got to this at the end, Ruthie, when, when you invoked Lenin, is that the work of organization is the work of what you called orienting towards the general. 
So how does one convene? How does one organize? How does one draw more, <laughs> more of us across difference towards that site of organization? Um, and in this, I think, um, I want to ask you a question about the state. <coughs> so, we know that you're a Leninist, and I know you claim that, that's what I have to be. <laughs> um, in a lot of your work and your, and your, your talking, your speaking, and in your writing, you, you use this frame, the anti-state state. Mm -hmm. The, which is to say that this is the state that works for capital, that works to facilitate the movement of capital to reproduce inequality, that sustains inequality, a state which uh, is minimal but can actually be quite big in terms of how much resources it sucks to be so minimal. Right? So this anti-state state, state, which is the state that we see reproduced with such rapidity in our world. But you, you hold open the possibility of what could be called a people state. A state which could be repurposed for the benefit of all, for, the, for, the, for, the, for processes of redistribution. And of course, Lenin has a very particular framing of this, right? So I guess I, I want, you know, how much are you leaning into a Leninist reading of the state as something that needs to be grasped to wither away? What is the relationship between, as was so central to, to Leninist thought, the relationship between that state which needs to be grasped and the party? Um, and in, in a situation that we are in, in which the state has been so thoroughly captured and repurposed as the, as the anti-state state, how do we retrieve, rethink, reanimate in your mind, in your, in your experience, that, that work of piecing together a state that, is, that, that could be called a people's state? So I think we're stuck in this moment of capture. Okay, that's the first question. The second question, <laughs> do I have time? No, okay, I'll leave that, but I really wanna ask the second question, so if I can get to it later. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, and with that, I think I'm going to go on to our next speech speaker, Asiban. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pa. Thank you so much, Kelly. And um, I also look forward to hearing from Vashna. I'm already with Nana. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to move between is it closer in English because that's how I speak every day. But whenever I do use is it closer, I am going to translate so that I am being so Um, Prof. Um, there's so much I would like to talk about, but maybe the first um, is to go back to the point you made about people who count and people who don't. Um, because now, when I think about organized abandonment, it's really about our lives, um, our lived experiences, and our struggles. And so, the show is Pilangalo. Um, we struggle. But as we do that every day, there are interruptions, there are disruptions, there are various kinds of violences uh, or violence that we encounter. And central to the pioneering of that disruption and interruption is the state and capital. So, my comrade, if you have a lot of disaster, organized abandonment, who is a So when Prof. Ruthie says, people who count and people who don't count, get closer to a double ketwa, I'm a pale massing. Wobani, Ababanwa, when the decisions are made, when the laws are written, 
when the policies are thought about? Yeah. And who are the people that are making those decisions? Yeah. And in the making of those decisions, what kind of lives every day are produced and reproduced? Yeah. That is organized abandonment. Yeah. Um, um, so, if we look at some of the South African examples, I'm seeing who um, is Florence Sikolani. It's not by mistake, this is Florence from Easy Domestic Workers, that only in 2019, domestic workers were allowed to claim for Queda, which is um, the insurance for people to claim for injury at work, uh, or if people die at work. Only in 2019 does the state decide to say domestic workers must then claim. That's organized abandonment. Yes. Um, comrades from Zikode village, um, comrades from Vusmoz Nyayazni corner. Um, it's not by mistake that when people struggle, uh, I'm getting to the organized violence, um, when people struggle against the state, uh, there are very young comrades at the Gode village who do theater and poetry. And in that cultural work, what they do um, is to make a life in rehearsal, which is what abolition is about. Which is to say, in Gabbana, these kids, they talk about the organized part, which is that, you know, every time their parents struggle, and uh, figure my police have to bully. That's the organized. But also they talk about the other organized that Prof talks about, um, which is based on an abolition consciousness, which is to think about how we struggle against all of these things daily. Um, Izolo, yesterday, um, I forget Prof who you quoted, but basically something, I might be wrong um, in how I paraphrase, but Basically that some of these things, or politics for some people is a matter of aesthetic, but for other people it's a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. That's the struggle that we, mm -hmm. that, that all of us face. Um, and it's not a mistake that even in this day and age, when we know that sex work is one of the longest professions, the government decides to still say sex work is criminal work. Um, because there's an assumption about who's the sex worker in South Africa. Yes. It's a black, poor woman. Yes. And so, so those are different kinds of organized abandonment that we as people have to think about. So it's as simple as, let us think about when um, you wake up, there's an interruption, probably, ulochiting. Um, <laughs> and then Vajna writes so beautifully, beautifully about what Prof uh, spoke about, um, capitalism, saving capitalism from capitalism, when Vajna speaks about um, electricity and the alternatives um, that people think about, which of course are about capital and the privatization, um, which is just decision, decision about other kinds of people can afford, other, other kinds of people should not afford. So when we say at the center of the daily disruptions, interruptions, and violence is capital and state, we mean exactly these decisions. Um, it's also not by mistake that uh, what Pumla Dineo called African feminist write about the, this South Africa as a rape capital. <clears throat> so you wake up, um, if, you, if you use an Uber, you probably have to send somebody um, where you're going, information which Uber, and also, you know, um, if you're in a taxi, you probably have to think, and maybe sometimes ask your boss, that you know boss, it's going to get very late, and I have to get on two taxis to get to work. That's the petition that Prof is referring to. That in very little literal terms, there's petitions that some kinds of people can live Pagude and other kinds of people can live closer. And central to that, or what makes it possible and sustains it, 
um, are the categories that are used. Race, mm -hmm. yes. gender, yes. and class. Yes. That is organized abandonment. Yes. So, so when Prof speaks about the organized in that way, in the violence, those are the kinds of things that I, I take away from them. Um, but also, I love Prof. When I said to Kelly, I was in part of a class that Kelly organized, and and I said to to, to to Kelly, I love how we talk about these things, but every time you read Prof's work, it lends you at a place of possibility and imagination. <coughs> you never are left at a place where you're like, are we all doomed? <laughs> what's the, I mean, what's the point of being here and gathering? Um, the point is that, you know, Again, I will use the words that Prof uses, life in rehearsal. Um, and we think about what makes that life in rehearsal possible. And so when she talks about the other organized, in our organized abandonment, I'm very excited. Um, and some of you might know um, that, you know, I'm a, I'm a daughter of a fifth generation farm worker. And I always want to stay on the abandonment and the organized, um, the, the, the organized violence of the organized. But what Prof is pushing me to do in my work is to think about the possibilities. But also what this does, I made an example about sex workers. I made an example about um, domestic workers. I make an example about farm workers. And there are very many other examples that I can make. But what it also shows us is what Prof spoke about, the importance of solidarity. Because whether we think capital, separate from state, which I don't mm, think, um, I don't make that, but anyway, um, whether we, if we ask ourselves the question of, in my daily disruptions um, and interruptions and violence, um, who's responsible for this? We probably will all arrive at the same answer. This is why we need solidarity. Prof, I used a different phrase today, but also there's a phrase, Richard, um, um, said Prof, um, words and concepts are so enabling. So Prof talks about um, radical dependency, not alliance. Radical dependency, not alliance. So alliance will say, um, alliance will say, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna put up a statement in support of the assassinations and alliance ends there. But radical dependency is when uh, Comrade Melita says, um, Comrades, we are being shot at here. Comrades, progressive lawyers, all comrades, scholar activists, we are there yes. in warm bodies mm -hmm. showing what we mean by radical dependency, yes. not alliance. Yes. And this is what we mean, or what probably means <laughs> by. Um, the other organized, what, what makes things possible. So, um, I, so, yeah, so I think those are my initial thoughts and comments and, and how I, I like to think about organized abandonment, not just the abandonment part, but the two kinds of organized, which is the organized violence, but also the organized, um, which adopts um, an abolition consciousness and makes us think about what is possible. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Well, there were comments in one, especially by bringing um, some of what is possible um, and the portals that are opened by radical solidarity, I think very seriously um, of this gifting that was given to me when I was on Coast Salish lands in, Tur in Turtle Island, what is now known as Vancouver or North America, where I was told, no, we don't need allies, that we need accomplices. Mm. We need people that will stand next to us. 
Uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to our final speaker before we um, enter into a very lively conversation um, and give uh, Prof. Ruthie an opportunity to respond. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Just like amazing ideas, and um, I started off like Kelly as well, thinking I'd have two questions, but they're over like five, six pages. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, please bear with me. Um, I think for me, also a Leninist, I was thinking much more about reading um, the work and all the work I've engaged with yours uh, through the lens, obviously, of my political ideology. And one of the things that I really was thinking about what was so useful about this notion of organized abandonment was in, when Engels is talking about the withering away of the state um, under socialism, it's something that where the state, I mean, the history of how the state is formed, it's formed from our power, the power we have, and then we create the state. But as the state becomes more powerful, it separates itself from us and creates this alienation between us and them. That's like the historical trajectory of how states are formed and through violence. And then to keep its power, it's formed through violence. So in the most, most liberatory and beautiful aspects of Marxism is this idea that that would wither away, that alienation. And almost that the state becomes very present within us. It's a present thing, it's a, but state meaning the power the power for us to organize ourselves every day, the power for us to make society work every day. That is present in us. It's not something we're giving up, that we become alienated from, and that we then have to basically beg for, mm -hmm. or ask for constantly, um, you know, vote for, choose. It's there, we are making it. And, you know, and then I was thinking about how our state has actually faced a withering away, a hollowing out through this neoliberal eco economics. Mm -hmm. But it's very different to the withering that was going to be liberationary and beautiful and this amazing thing that Engels and them spoke about that you have time for poetry and painting and doing the work you enjoy and being close to the earth. It's something really disastrous and horrible. And I've often been thinking about this and I think for me, what's been so useful about this notion of organized abandonment is I always assumed goodwill on the part of these actors within the state. Mm -hmm that they were just didn't have the political will. Mm -hmm. And that almost is passive. Like they're just not doing anything. But with this concept, you begin to understand that they are doing things. That they are, making, they are actually doing things to hollow out the state. There's active steps that are, there are plans, mm -hmm. as you said, which is such a useful way. It's such a more understanding of, of it's not just passive. Because passive, then we, we, we are likely not to give them the agency to do this, and it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. So when they do arrive, or the right people get into state power, then it will be fixed. And this speaks to the nature of the state that we have developed and inherited through capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I think when um, Comrade um, Kelly was speaking, she said that the state and capital together. But what we have is a bourgeois state. It's in its nature embedded within capital. Mm -hmm. It will serve capital. The boundaries it chooses to protect is that of capital, it's that of the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. That's why it can become more and more defunct for the majority of society, mm -hmm. because it's the bourgeoisie that can afford this, this dysfunctionality in society. They can go and get solar power, or go and, I don't know, drink bottled water, mm -hmm. do all of these things that the rest of society cannot do. And in creating that inequality, it's incredibly important. It's actually capitalism saving capitalism saving capitalism, because it needs those to exploit and oppress. Mm -hmm. It needs that, it needs the majority of society to be rendered waste, because if you have agency, if you have alternatives, you're not going to allow this to occur. So the more desperate your plight becomes, the more powerful in a way this ineffective state and capitalism becomes. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting for me to, to see that. And so the class question has to be at the center of this discussion about us understanding the nature of the state. It's not a benign thing that just, oh, you know, Sorun Amakosa is shocked and surprised. Mm. You know, he's always shocked and surprised. Yeah. Apparently, four weeks ago, before he was found with all this legal stuff, he was shocked and surprised to see a pothole somewhere. You know, he's like shocked and surprised. But that creates this idea that he's unaware, that he's blind, when he's deeply implicated 
within the system and constantly they are working to keep it. And this speaks to what Comrade Ruthie was talking about when she said that the bureaucracy, the system, uh, the boundaries are there but they can change. The actors in the state can change. For example, if you look at the history of the South African state and in reading the work and thinking through your concepts, I was thinking about it through the history, like thinking about reading it through the South African history. And if you read the history of South Africa, at first with the union government, it was a coming together of Afrikaner and English capital to make peace and then to police the rest of society on their behalf mm -hmm. through very draconian measures. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have the 94 moment and you think, oh, this is going to be it. But then that's another co coming together of capital white and black capital to police the rest of society on behalf of capital. So it's just the changing of the bodies. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of it, we don't even change the buildings of power. Yeah. We keep it. I mean, the cement you were talking about it, that was used to build these things are still there and we just go and occupy it. We don't even change that. We make some perfunctory changes like we can wear a particular Sheshwe print to, to Parliament or something, yeah. but the actual structure remains and you can't move within those boundaries. Mm. Those boundaries are policed itself. So that is why when you think about people like Cabral and you think about people like Sankara, they were really trying to break those boundaries. And I was thinking about this as well because, you know, if you go back, I know a lot has happened since 1994. And there's been a lot of sense of abandonment. There's been a lot of sense of disillusionment. But in 1994, when the ANC comes into power, it comes into power with a lot of hege hegemonic power. It comes in with that massive cultural power amongst the majority of society. And still, it chose not to shift the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that is something I would like you to speak more to. Like, what is it when you have the cultural power, when you can make these changes, and you don't make it? Because when you are organizing constantly, and you think, oh, what is it that we can do? Because if you think back to the 80s, you had the labor movement, you had the ICU, you had, like, Comrade Kelly was saying, not just a union labor movement, trade unions, you had women, you had churches, you had everything agitated, organized, and mobilized in society to make these changes. And we dissipated mm -hmm. that organizational and mobilizing capacity that we had. And that was, some argue, actively done in various ways. So that is something I think we should think about much more. The other thing, and then I'll, I'll shut up, is, um, <laughs> is us thinking about the role of culture. Yes. Because yes, it's bureaucracy. Yes, it's the police. Yes, it's the violence. In fact, it seems to me that when the state is more violent, our pact with capital has been weakened. Mm -hmm. Our social pact. Yeah. Because if you see a place like, I don't know, Norway or Sweden or whatever, there's not the same level of violence. Because the social pact is much more intact. Doesn't mean people are not oppressed and exploited. It just means that they don't feel as bad about being exploited and because capital has a much more human face, it has a much more interaction with people on, on, a, on, a, on a social compact way. But when there's violence and the building of prisons in the 1980s that you're talking about in the US and in South Africa, you see, it's when capital just doesn't care anymore that social compact has been broken. And that is a dangerous time, but it's also the time for most organizing. Because society is on the back foot. We are all feeling it. So this is like a moment that we can seize when it's at showing us its most, its worst face, I think. And I think the role of culture is important in that because culture works in two ways. In terms of the organized abandonment, it works in legitimating it too. So for example, um, with electricity, because it's on all our minds, you have a very um, good discourse, environment. Get green energy, get solar energy, that's better. Coal is a problem, all of this stuff. Even though Europe has burned coal and still our, sh our tra trains are taking coal out to our harbors to ship it to Europe for them to burn, we are being told to be green. Now that, no one obviously wants the world to come to an end or hates the environment, but that discourse is being used, which is a very good discourse, to cut out the majority of South Africans from accessing a basic right. Mm -hmm. 
So it's also the culture and the discourses that I use with abandonment. And then there's also the sort of, all the, the, the silence. Because you have, you have discourses used, you have culture used, and you have lots of rhetoric around why it's been done, the World Bank thinks it's better, we have less education and less nurses, and it's for our own good because you took loans, you're bad at managing money, whatever it is. But then, for those people that don't count within the system, there's also a silence of that abandonment. Mm -hmm. For example, when Marikana happens, mm -hmm. it was a complete outrage. But it happened on television. We could see it. Mm -hmm. Hence that outrage. In the labor movement, we know that routinely mine workers are trapped underground. Routinely mine workers lose their lives. About, before, just before COVID hit, there were female mine workers who were organizing against mine bosses and, and, and supervisors who were basically requesting sexual favors to get positions to go underground. And they were protesting against this. And they had locked themselves underground. But that didn't even make any newspaper major headlines in our country. It was not seen. So I think for us, the oppositional cultural work that Comrade Yuvon was talking about, we need to be able to be present. We need to see, we need to affirm, we need to be in solidarity with. And that is what will make it. And then for that joy, we need to understand that, you know, we are living in very difficult times in history. But people have always lived in difficult times. Yes. I mean, you know, during slavery, that wasn't a great time. Uh, the Industrial Revolution wasn't particularly nice. Colonialism, apartheid, wasn't a good time. But if you look back and you think about what people produced, the culture that they produced, it was amazing to give joy, to reconstitute their humanity. Yes. If you think of the union halls uh, that come out, I mean, the history of capital is so evil, I'm sorry, it, it, it cuts away people from the land, from their families, it deracinates you culturally. Yes. And then what you have to do is, you have to go into these places, whether it's the mines, whether it's factories in England, and you are totally deracinated from culture, from family, from how you made meaning of the world, but people reconstitute it. They do so in beautiful ways. Yes, there's flaws, I'm not saying this is a perfect world, but people are doing that labor. In the union movement, it's incredibly important for us to reconstitute our humanity. The songs, the coming together, the when we protest, it's like a joyful time. It's, it's not this, 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 this ways in which it's portrayed in the media. So I think that's uh, a way in which we can be present and we can contribute and be in this rehearsal constantly. So we don't give our powers up to some protagonists in the struggle, which is what we tend to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so, so much. Um, before I give um, our esteemed professor and comrade a chance to respond to these incredibly generous questions, and generative questions, I just want to kind of um, maybe go through a tiny overview of like some of the um, important things. So um, what Dr. Kelly Gillespie was speaking about and what really jumped out at me is um, uh, Professor Ruthie's sort of reconfiguration of what can count as a prison. That if we say that freedom is a place, that we can also turn that on its head that unfreedom is also a place. Mm -hmm. And we know where those places are but also, I think what what is what was so incredibly um, um, brilliant and scary about um, expanding the notions of abolition away from just the site of the prison as a site of struggle is also reformulating who gets to be a cop and what counts as a cop. I think about this idea around guard duty and these jobs, <laughs> these jobs, um, all the way from. Uh, these ideas of, of cops that we encounter in our corporate lives, mm -hmm. like the line manager, mm -hmm. um, that but really as as <laughs> as part of a particular system, of a larger system, that that mechanics are geared up for a very specific kind of person. And I think really specifically from your response to think about race and securitization. Um, my partner and I just came back from Cape Town and just walking around Seapoint and thinking about private security um, and much is made of Cape Town's spatial apartheid and to think, really think about what does it mean then to ab abolish a prison which in itself is a, a colony enjoying a, se a second haunting 
on very specific sorts of people. To think about um, Naivan, um, what kind of lives are produced and reproduced um, by, by organized abandonment. And thank you so much for bringing domestic work and sex work into this space, because I think that where we see, and I, I, I think about um, Professor Ruthie's incredibly famous um, uh, definition of racism, and thinking about premature death, that in, in decoupling or de-emphasizing the history of race as skin color, and to really re-emphasize a marking of premature death, expands who we get to see this system working on. So thank you so much for bringing those people into the space. Um, I'm also um, really thinking about, um, in my own work, I'm deeply influenced by the work of Mrs. Tanda Bongela, who's about to come up with an incredible film, but she uh, reformulates what happened in this country, apartheid, which I think about separateness, and to think about all organizedness in, the, in itself as ugutagata, that things were done to us. But in 1652, but in 1910, but in 1913, but in 1948. And um, there's a section of, of the book in which you speak about magic, but in connection to abolition. And I would love to hear you speak a little bit more about that. And then, Vashna, thank you so much. As a, as a fellow, I think, baby Leninist, because I'm still trying to figure <laughs> out. Thank you. So I'm like seeing so much and, 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 and being deeply seduced by it, by, by naming the South African state as we find ourselves as a, as a state that works for the bourgeois, as a bourgeois state. Um, thank you as, as well for bringing that through. Um, but in your insistence that class must be at the center of the system, I think you puncture at, at a silence where we aren't accustomed in kind of organized spaces to speak about class. It is this very uncomfortable um, and I, I, not just silent, but silenced conversation because we really got to talk about it. We would be growing class traitors, which is not something that the state wants. Um, and with that, I, I give over um, to our esteemed comrade, uh, Professor Yves Ngomo, to respond. <laughs> I'm now full of a lot of, of exciting ideas. Thank you all for your wonderful comments. I feel stronger and taller and actually a little bit younger than I did when I sat down um, a little while ago in, in the special chair. Is this always the special chair for special guests? It's fantastic. And I want to thank the comrade who carried it across the street. That is, that is a labor of love and, and serious solidarity. Um, let, me, let me engage with a, a few of the um, uh, many exciting um, comments and uh, challenges that have come up in our conversation. And I just want to say to anybody who wonders in the audience, I don't feel the least bit defensive. The whole purpose of this kind of encounter is for us to figure things out together. And um, so if I repeat myself, it's because that's where I'm stuck now, rather than I'm insisting that whatever I said before is all there is to be said, all right? Um, and I'll, I'll start you know, trying a little bit, and thank you, Vashna, for, for doing so much, so much of this work for me, um, trying a little bit to address the question of the state. And it's so frequently the case wherever I find myself, whatever comrades I'm in conversation with, that the state seems to be, on the one hand, a timeless object of antagonism rather than something that changes over time and has particular manifestations, rather than a, a large scale and complex set of um, agencies and institutions. So the state's an institution, it's made up of institutions, and they are in competition with each other as well as in collaboration with each other. So that's, that's where I want to start, and the bourgeois state is the state that we are all struggling um, against 
and in and through. I teach at a huge public university. There are half a million students enrolled in my university in a city of eight million people. That's an astonishing thing. It's a, it used to be free, it's not quite free yet, but compared to the price of uh, other universities, public and not public, it is still reasonably affordable, even though more and more students are compelled to use debt to pay for school recently. Uh, in in uh, the last few years, in part spurred by COVID, the university decided to reduce the debt of all the students, which was a good thing. It was a good thing. So I am part of the state. You know, I teach at a public university. The state of New York pays my salary every month, and unfortunately, they do pay my salary every month. And uh, that said, we in the education sector are constantly struggling, and that's, that would be true here and many other places, are constantly struggling to seize the resources that are shuffled off to the forces of organized violence and bring them back into our, um, our agency, education, in order to secure some kind of future. Now that itself becomes complicated when the bosses of the bourgeois state show up and say, okay, fine, education is indeed a very good thing, but what all of you should do is show how the educational services you provide to the students will help them become more productive in the already existing system, right? Can we make little junior capitalists and happy little young capitalist workers is, is the problem. So that, those are some of the contradictions that we face. And yet, I'll say again, I think, I know that large scale public education that we can seize and direct is a good thing. And, and something in which people have the ability to create capacity, which is to say to make power. Of that, I am absolutely convinced. So let's take another example, water. Everybody needs water. Every, we are water beings on the water planet. That's what we are. We're made of water. I mean, the Bible says dust thou art, but it's water that we are. A little bit of dust mixed in for shape. <laughs> We see in so many places that the provision of water is uh, fought over constantly, and the organized abandonment of communities when it comes to water is one of the key features of contemporary life on the entire planet. There's a brilliant young um, researcher called Dolly Daktari, who has written a fantastic book, maybe five or six years old, in which she does a fantastic analysis of how various forces have competed and colluded in the context of a good deal of rural India, in some cases upholding the old, really feudal structures that form part of the bourgeois state of India's structural coherence, and in other cases, interrupting that structure, but still making it impossible for ordinary people, i.e. the people who, in our analysis tonight, are the ones who don't count, um, it, making it impossible for them to have adequate water when they need it. Right? So this is an example, and we can go around the world and see these examples including what I saw here on Tuesday and the city of Flint, Michigan, where famously the water is poisoned. Famously, the water is poisoned, uh, and so forth. So the state abandoned people and did that in an organized way. People took decisions that resulted in that 
poisoned water. But my question is, do we not want the infrastructural capacity at our com command and control to produce the water that we need? That's the question, rather than is the state a good thing or a bad thing. Now, then we could say, we can debate, and we should debate, whether we think that thing that I just named institutional capacity, infrastructural, excuse me, capacity, and the institutional forms that maintain it, whether we're gonna call it the state or something else. And I'm often quick to say, I don't care what we call it, but maybe I do, and right now, what we should call it is the state that we want, right? Which is the one that we need. And we can go through a number of other examples um, to, to start to look toward the question that Kelly put to us, and I would like to hear more. Um, Yvonne, Comrade Yvonne, I loved that you started your comments with early on with the word interruption. It's such a crucial word for how we live our lives. Many years ago, when I was writing, I think the oldest thing that's in this book, which I wrote when I was a dropout, I didn't, I didn't even have a job of any kind at the time. I was very happy. <laughs> um, very, very happy, and, and reading, and reading, and reading, and debating, and doing things with comrades. Um, I, I started to think as well as I could, which is not well enough for what we need, but I started to think about how organizing and writing are two practices that are shaped by interruption, right? That for organizing and for writing, what do we do? We start and start over again. We start and start over again. And that each starting over again is the result of some kind of interruption, but that doesn't make it, as Comrade Yvonne was showing us, a bad thing, but rather something that gives us the opportunity to open our consciousness and think again about how we're doing what we're doing in order to do it in perhaps a different, which is to say, more capacity building way. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the writer who I uh, was talking about last night, his name is Edouard Louis, he's French, very nice guy. He's not one of those French theorists that everybody you know, hits people over the head with. <laughs> um, and he said in a, in a book uh, in which he wrote about the death of his father, so he's white, French, from Northwest deindustrialized France, um, he said, he realized, as he was coming of age, that for some people, politics is aesthetics, whereas for others, it's life and death. And I think that's a very powerful way to think what we're trying to think about and understand today. That doesn't make aesthetics bad. Aesthetics is a good thing, but it depends on how we pursue and use our capacity for understanding and making aesthetic um, uh, experiences in the world. Um, I second comrade uh, about uh, thank you for raising domestic workers. I was raised by uh, my grandma was a domestic worker. Um, and thinking very hard about what the decisions are and understanding and thank you again for saying out loud that partitions are literal. This isn't just like a word that's derived from French that seems to be, you know, somehow in and of itself magically meaningful. Right? It's not. There aren't any magic words. I don't know what you want me to say about magic later, but there aren't any magic words. Even though sometimes people will lift some words, like freedom is a place, and hope that it will magically produce an understanding. And I respect that desire. Because after all, magic is what we don't already understand how to do. Right? So magic should actually inform how we go about 
um, pursuing making the world that we want. Um, but these partitions are literal, even if they're invisible, frequently. Frequently invisible. They have, in fact, body and flesh, and mind, and mind. I'm, I'm a little discouraged, frequently, by how uh, many people, at least in uh, English language discourse about politics and race, have gotten in the habit of referring to um, the people they imagine are history's victims as bodies, mm. like everybody's already dead. Mm. You know, yeah. we, I have a body, I'm not <laughs> denying that, but I am a being and that's what matters. Right? So, uh, why, for whatever reason, bodies became the word that people used to say, oh, they killed black bodies. Mm. Oh, they killed this one. Oh, they raped these bodies. People, people. This is really a, a, a pretty simple point. Um, but I think sometimes changing, again, I'm kind of stuck in English here, but changing the word we use gives us opportunity to think again about the other ways that we have thought about and approached problems mm -hmm. and the solutions to them. Um, uh, Vashna, I've looked forward to meeting you for so long. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> Hooray. Um, the, the, the issue to go back to the state of having the state, not begging the state, is a great and crucial formulation, which isn't easy to realize, but if we think about it, uh, perhaps there are possibilities for realizing the having as against the begging. I have some comrades who are uh, very old-fashioned economists and geographers, like really old-fashioned, and they're great researchers. And they have been working on a pro they work on many projects, trying to help communities, these folks are in Southern California, but they try to help uh, communities with their research understand where the um, sort of flashpoints of organized abandonment are so that communities that are already starting to mobilize can seize the opportunity to try to make their lives better as quickly as possible. This is the commitment of this little research organization, just two guys really in an office who've been doing this for 30 some odd years. One of the projects they've been working on on the side for some years is based in the assumption that an organized, uh, excuse me, a, a capitalist firm like Amazon should be a public utility. Amazon should not be ownable by anybody. It should be owned by all of us. And so as they do their research toward making that argument, they do research that helps people who are doing union organizing uh, in, against Amazon. Um, they do that research to help uh, poor communities that are um, resource uh, starved, whose roads, you know, Ramaphosa would be shocked and dismayed, <laughs> you know, whose roads are a mess, whose uh, sidewalks and schools are a mess, but where Amazon rolls through with their trucks, carrying the goods to everybody who orders from them, um, those communities get worse, yeah. whose children suffer from asthma because of the prevalence of diesel fuel, which is true here, it's true everywhere. More people die of asthma than even have died of COVID, right? That is one of the scourges of the planet. And so what my comrades are doing is trying to piece together these various bits of research in order to make that research available to somebody who shows up and says, we have a campaign and we could use that to make our campaign better. And that's the work that researchers should do, whether in, in the academy, whether standalone, 
whether the research organizations and unions and faith communities and so forth, that's what it should do. It's like, do the work so that, as one of my uh, comrades who does environmental degradation, environmental science, says, I do my work and put together my findings so that when you all are ready to do some data judo, I've got it for you. And I give you the data so you can flip somebody. Right? So she's not an organizer. She doesn't pretend to be an organizer. She doesn't want to be an organizer. She's very shy and introverted. But she does great research that other people can use. So these are some examples. Um, I want to say a couple more things, and then I guess I should, it's time to wrap up. Um, one of the words we haven't used tonight is fascism, and we might as well use it. Because when we talk about the uh, complacency or eagerness of those who count when it comes to the forces of organized violence, uh, establishing and securing partitions. We're talking about the rise again of fascism that's happening in many places on the planet. And the possibility for the bourgeois state to flip to the fascist state is pretty obvious. And all of the people who, as Comrade Richard was explaining to me the other night, were really excited when the various ministries of South Africa said, and so to fight COVID, we're going to have lockdown. Mm -hmm. And people were thrilled by the prospect that somebody else, all the somebody else's but them and their little neighborhoods, were going to be locked down, gives us an indication of how ready people are for fascism, for fascism. I mean, all of the stories about you know, Trump and so on and so forth in the United States, it's all about readiness for fascism. It, it is an expression of white supremacy, and there are a lot of black and brown people who are in it. Because at the end of the day, it will be fascism. And those who are selected to be among the elite of fascism and its beneficiaries will eat better, as was the case under the Nazis and others will be consigned to the horrors of premature death. Um, the, I already talked a little bit about education. I'll leave it, other than to say that the possibilities for um, establishing um, uh, what we call free schools or survival schools or independent schools or pop-up schools, uh, there are models from around the world. Indigenous people in North America have been doing this off and on for the entire history of colonialism. And what we see, whether we look at the images um, in, the, in the back of our space here and think about our fallen comrade and look at the facade of his house where they broke the window to shoot him, or we think about the children in the various villages and communities who cannot get to a school, right? They can't get there either because of the friction of distance, it's too far to go, or the friction of cost, it's nearby and it's private. Either friction keeps people away from school. That combination tells us not only that human sacrifice characterizes our present, but the future is, is being destroyed systematically, and this too is part of organized abandonment. Um, last thing I'll say now, I want to say something about green energy because I want to talk about land dispossession. Um, I work. Uh, I've done a lot of work with comrades who themselves have worked with Via Campesina and, and various organizations uh, who are uh, fighting to, against land dispossession and also for the capacity for self-determination 
among people who produce food and other agricultural goods. And as you probably all know, on the planet, there are four or five firms, four or five corporations that control the um, uh, distribution of most things that most people eat on a world scale. So four or five firms, well, oh, how are we gonna fight that? Well, let's drop down closer to the ground and notice that 70% of all of the things that we can eat and a good deal of other agricultural products are produced by small producers. Now, this difference, by firms, 70%, doesn't immediately give us a class for itself that's going to fight because some of these small producers are these family farmers that Yvonne, um, Comrade Yvonne is fifth generation child of, the workers of, so they aren't necessarily somehow objectively um, the good guys. But it does, this, this fact of 70%, does give us some opportunity to think really hard about the possibilities for organizing that organizations like the MST have brought, you know, realized in the context of land occupations and agricultural um, small d development in Brazil. So you might well know that the MST is now the largest producer of organic rice in Latin America, the largest. And because of their principles, they distribute that rice in such a way that people who need healthy food can get it. There, there isn't a barrier of cost, and they get that rice under the, for example, the hardened partition or blockade that keeps Venezuela and Cuba um, constantly struggling for adequate nutrition um, and on. Now, green energy is supposed to save everybody, right? You know, as, as Comrade Vashna was saying. And yet we know that for green energy to be made, dispossession is necessary unless we are the authority, let's call it the state, that determines how green energy will pr be produced, under what conditions, and to what end. So in the short run, we see that many international financial institutions, including pension funds, including the pension fund that I will get my old age pension from when I retire next year, have the sustainable investment program, looks really good on paper, where they are investing in buying land in places like Brazil, Tanzania, and so forth, that they will convert from whatever use it is now uh, for to growing things like sugar and other um, items that can be converted into biofuel, green energy. Yeah? So this is dispossession by people in the global north, Canada Pension Fund, my pension fund, and others, who agreed as a matter of union negotiation to accept deferred compensation. A pension in those economies is not a right. It's deferred compensation. If you don't work, you don't get a pension. It's not, it's not a matter of human right that in your old age you have rest and adequate nutrition and shelter. You have to work for it. But that deferred compensation, which then becomes the pot for investment by the pension funds in order to pay us all our little pensions when we retire, is the instrument used to dispossess our comrades in the global south from the land in order to grow something that will be used as biofuel, allegedly to save the planet. So these are some of the contradictions that comrades are working through, uh, organizing around, and I just, I guess, wanna end by saying, in the beginning of the day and the end, while we are water beings on the water planet, it's always about land. Thank you. Thank you. Deeply, Comrade Vicky, for that response. 
um, and succinct sort of ending to um, of reminding us who we are molecularly, atomically, um, that we are bodies, that we're beings, which is deeply important. Um, with that, I really want to open up in the last, ooh wee, um, in the last 10 minutes, I suppose, um, to, to the audience um, for any questions. Um, and the questions can be for anyone on the panel. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. I, I've, uh, I, I started working in solitary with critical resistance back in the 90s. I was at the ABC for a long time. Oh, cool. Um, so what I wanted to ask is, in the context, in our current context, I'm also a student of Kevin, sorry, I'm sitting here from the EWC. Um, so in the, in the current context, what we're talking about is a neoliberal state that's really been captured by financial elites, right? And in that context, I see a disconnect between the kind of very important bottom-up initiatives that you're talking about and that you, you know, many on the panel have talked about and have learned so much about, and the actual reforms that would be necessary <laughs> to quote-unquote liberate the neoliberal state from the financial corporate oligarchy, right? And you know, those policies are also written about and those policies are talked about elsewhere. Uh, so I'm talking about things like maybe a wealth tax, I'm talking about <coughs> Reintroducing, you know, financial regulation, you know, undoing trade liberalization, and so on. I mean, these are things that people fought against, and, and by I mean people, I mean the organized left, largely, fought against in the 80s and 90s, and maybe even earlier, maybe even the 70s. And, you know, as soon as neoliberalism, neoliberalism sort of came about. Now, the problem is if we, if, if most of what we're doing is just trying to survive, which I, we have to do, how do we actually bridge that gap and actually? put pressure to liberate the state from the corporate financial oligarchy that currently controls it completely. Because if I'm being a defender of the ANC, not that I, I'm a defender of the ANC, but if, I'm, if, I, if we have a defender of the ANC here, what they would say, I know because I've, I've debated with this, this with them ad nauseum, mm -hmm. what they would say is, look, we don't have any choice. The second we, you know, look at what's happened to Zimbabwe, look at what's, what's happened to any country that steps out of line, this is what we have to do, we have to dismantle we have to separate the people from the state. That's what we have to do. We have no choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Malibuongwe. Ika malama kusigazi. My name is Florence Golan. I stand here as a domestic worker. Before I can say anything, I extend my heart to my comrades, BWC, which were involved in an accident last week when we came to an event about the domestic workers. Almost all the crew was involved in an accident. Um, yes, I extend my uh, heart to them. Um, that will be my privilege to meet you. Uh, I don't know where to start. Sometimes I laugh at my own pain. And sometimes I go through it. But I feel like I owe it to some of the domestic workers that doesn't have the privilege to stand and hold the mic. Because when you speak about freedom, they don't have it. They are silence. The freedom of the domestic workers has to become when they are being given their voices back. When you talk, we talk to our bosses, they say, we are in the same boat. How can we be in the same boat when I'm peddling and when you're, you're driving a yacht? So it gives to me that you say, oh, the government is saying you are under minimum wage. So there's no uh, alliance that allows me to give you the, the raise. How do I live? my life in a measured uh, decision, whereby my, my life is being measured, that I am uh, living under a minimum wage. Um, recently, I've seen domestic workers. They've been affected by the, the COVID. Some of them 
they were never allowed to go home. They were isolated from their kids. They were separated from their families. And at the same time, they were also isolated from their boss's premises, whereby you are at the background. You don't know what's happening. And we stand here, we say, okay, we, I want to end the inequality. How do we end the inequality when there are people who are still producing medicine at the poor products? When there are people who are still allowed to, uh, uh, to say, your health doesn't matter. There is poor medicine. There is food for poor. There, there are people who wants to give the name or the explanation to the word poor or give the meaning to it. And that, I will say, it stands for black. Whereby it will be the example of a poor. Because if one of them, they will have a full loaf of bread, they will have their full slices. To define the word poor, they will need to know where to throw away their crumbles from their bread. And whereby, those are the, for me, I will speak on my field of work, you know, as a domestic worker. Mm -hmm. So after they eat all the, their bread, from the fresh bread, the crumbs are being given to me. And if they say, no, this food cannot be eaten by my family, my family is going to eat it because I don't know what hazard is in that food. I can't even think about it. But they know and say, if maybe you can take it home and give it to your family. I'll take it home because I need the food and I don't have a choice. When they say, okay, who are to be served? I think of my children because I am in my backyard with my boss, looking after my boss kids. And then my kids has got no one to save them. Those are an, an, an abandoned nation of which when I go home, I can be even called to a death of my child. While this, I was busy looking at another child, uh, another woman's child. The same woman who is denying me the right to a health living, the right to good food, the right to health food, the right to the right medication for my body to be physical. The right to give me the right pain to upgrade my life or to send my, my child to a better school so that they can upgrade their life. That goes to the same woman who would look into my eyes and say, you don't deserve it. And then we say, you want to end the inequality. When we stand, when we, the, the minister is saying, we involve you in the minimum wage. But at the same time, some people are getting their pay rise every year. And as domestic workers say, you are not entitled. You don't, you have the uh, 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 availability to say, okay, you're going to be given your uh, pay rise every year. So that means I'm stuck in, in one place. They say we are in the under corridor. Yes, we are under corridor, but some bosses they migrate. Some bosses they they, they they relocate. Where do I get in touch with them? So we need to be say, okay, this is where God had. Who is gonna fill up that form for me? No one. So we are for the abandoned nation that we have been chosen to be rejected, that we have been chosen not to be saved, that we have been chosen not to be upgraded. We work under the slavery hours, the slavery work, the workload, the hours. And then they stand and then the minister is going to say, I am earning the minimum wage. Do you know what I do in this house, in this person's house? You don't know. Do you know what workload that I'm going through? You don't know. Even if I had, I'm, I'm getting hurt, no one is going to be my witness. Have you ever in your life thought of, how many of these workers have disappeared, killed by their bosses, and they said they went out for off days, they went out to leave. Why does they know? They know what they did. Somebody is being buried behind their backyard. And then they said she went on off days, but they never reached their destination to see their kids. So who do they choose to serve? The rich and famous, who are in the yard sipping their wine with their kids that will never eat, that some of our kids will never sit, eat from the same pot with them. And that's the continuation of say, I raise somebody else's child who will be, will grow up and say, 
we are told that we are never going to eat and sit on the table and eat the food from the same pot with you. Those are the keys that I measured with my own hands. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one, one more response, um, and then we'll have to, we'll have to end this. Yo. Uh, I'm from Northern Cape. Uh, usually we were having meeting was just, uh, we were having a space like this as a feminist from different genders. So we read about this gathering, then we said, no man, let's go and, and, and start, grab some ideas how to make changes into our society. Because you cannot make a changes when you are alone. You need to have people so that you can have uh, changes in your society. You, what I want to say is that uh, I want to say I'm a community of care workers. Uh, since I work in a community of care workers, uh, now I'm here in tennis. I started as a volunteer. Uh, we've been fighting in a government to be permanently in bread. When you talk about the issue of Koida, I was very touched because uh, the job that we are doing, to be honest, is not being recognized. Uh, you see, I'm born where I'm working in a facility. I'm doing a job of a nurse. Uh, I have to carry a child so that a nurse can put injection into a child. So it's like I'm a, I'm a slave. So I don't have, when even I was, I was trying to speak out that I'm not supposed to speak. It's like my right is not being, yes. So the thing that I want to raise is, uh, I want to go back to politicians. I remember the time when we were, we were, we were coming from apartheid whereby we were uh, threatened and treated like a slavery. And then in 1994, then we said that we want to have freedom. And then it's when now we put Nelson Mandela in to be our black president. And then we said now, meaning that the chain that we were holding us, it's over. But the way I see it now, we still are on the chain. There is no change as corporate. Uh, uh, we were having trust on ANC. Uh, uh, but today, uh, they are feeling us. Because uh, as a community of care workers, né, you see, I've been 10 years in the field, but they are deploying. Uh, a person who's been sitting at home is coming to do my job or to be given a permanent uh, status on the clinic. So sometimes I feel like, what is the reason of me voting and voting, but although our, our government, our politics are not recognizing us. And when they sit in jail, they are not talking about us. It's always about them, mm -hmm. about getting what they want, about having the fancy things, about having the car. But they are not thinking that we are here because of the people that are on the ground. Without them, we don't have nothing. So I'm a little bit I'm nervous about the thing of the politics. Because if good ANC could stay with us, we could not have the problems that we are facing right now. Look at the climate changes. Look how the economy is been dropping. Look what is happening. Look how, how, how life is difficult. Life is difficult. You can see it. Uh, that's why sometimes we, we find our children being on the street, uh, crowds high. But what we are doing, what ESC is doing, what politics is doing when they are sitting up there discussing about us and the issue of women. I'm a little bit uh, nervous on that. Where I come from, women each and every day have been, have been raped. There was a woman who was raped by children. They were under 15 years. You know what they do to that woman? They take out the his by a piece by the touch. And then after that, they put a bottle in the vagina of that woman. You know, those children are out now. There was no justice for that. It's like we as women, we have not been recognized. So what I want to say is that my government, let's stand together and have one voice. One voice, everything will be all right. The thing is that we've been hiding under the, the black carpet. We don't want to come out. 
because we are afraid to raise out our voices. Because I know that when I raise out their voices, I will be a target. So what is important is that let's be a one voice so that our country can go back where we want it to be. Thank you, Makarani. I'll try and keep this short. My name is Doreen, my pronouns are she, they. Thank you very much to all the speakers, um, you know, for the wonderful input. And I guess my question is more for Kelly and Yvonne and Vashna, more than, <laughs> more than Ruthie, because it's, um, Kelly, you brought up the, that, you know, you pointed out very rightly that the conversation was looking at the, you know, what abolition encompasses and not just how it just focuses on abolition of prisons or the police. And I was just wondering though that in the context of South Africa and Africa more broadly, the conversation even, you know, the idea of thinking about abolishing prisons is not something that is actually taking place um, and people aren't very comfortable or open to thinking about. And I was just wondering if there wouldn't be still room or need to also have a very focused conversation to those particular institutions of oppressive systems, um, and not just as symptoms, but um, conspirators, right, of the oppressive systems. And I'm just thinking about how casualty is very embedded in, in, in most organizing in the country and on the continent around various issues, social and economic issues, that casualty is always centered as the primary solution to the issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there still isn't a need to actually have those specific conversations as well. Okay, um, I'm going to give it back for responses so that we can wrap up. Do we have time? Do we have time for mm -hmm. I think we're I think we are. We have five minutes. <laughs> We have five, just five. We're gonna wrap up at half past. Is that okay? Let them in. Okay, five minutes for responses, and then we can absolutely wrap up. Thank you for staying with us. So, just I think quickly to your to respond to your very important point. Yes, we need to have that conversation. Um, for me, I was extremely um, moved when during COVID, during the lockdown, right, which was kind of partitions and under the sign of public health the military was deployed, right? Um, and there was a whole lot of people working against that deployment, which was also extremely important and, and, um, and heartening. Um, but one of the most important formations for me was in Kaili Chaha. Do you know Kaili Chaha in Cape Town? Yes. Um, there was a group of uh, activists who were trying to support the community with the distribution of food, um, also recognizing that a lot of people were being thrown out of their backyards because people were so desperate for, for the small income from backyard shacks that they had to, that they, they evicted, they didn't have to evict, but they evicted because they were so desperate for money, right? There's a sh very short supply of money to go around. That, those evictions uh, created the conditions for for mass occupation of land. So there were like 180 uh, land occupations. And, and one of the first things that was done to fix the problem was that law enforcement, which is this metro level policing force that's being built by the city of Cape Town at the moment, right? Because that isn't good enough, so they're building this army of, it's the, it's the budget, the only budget that's going up right now is the, is the law enforcement, metro level security, which is highly unregulated uh, and increasingly getting more and more arms and ammunition, etc. And this is what's happening all over, right? So this, the, the group that was organizing to distribute food and to support that, the occupation so that people could have shelter under COVID, the, what they noticed was that the thing that the state was providing was security and law enforcement, right? which was coming down with such force, like apartheid style tactics on, on, on poor black people. And so they made uh, masks that said abolish law enforcement, right? And they started to mobilize around abolition. These are some of the people that we've been meeting. Um, but if the fix, we see more and more and more that the fix, to fix the problem is not to provide housing and food mm -hmm. and land. Mm -hmm. 
it's to provide securitization, mm -hmm. to keep inequality in place. It's not to fix the problem of inequality, it's to try and hold off yeah. the yeah. resistance to inequality. Exactly. And so this comrades, we cannot allow for this to be the politics of the state in our times. Mm -hmm. We cannot allow it. If we're going to have a state, it needs to be a state that fixes the problem of inequality. Mm. Can't be the state that provides securitization for the ongoing onslaught of inequality, right? So in this, in this, if this is the analysis, if we're seeing this happening, and comrades are beginning to organize around it because we see that this is what is happening, then yes, we need to have a very strong conversation about the abolition of police and prisons. Mm -hmm. And with with that, I think. I'm, I'm going to have to um, close off and invite Ndata Mulala to give the vote of thanks. Um, but before I do, I would like to thank everyone that spoke and everyone that shared space with us um, and for us to think and dream together. And finally, just before, I'm sorry, I'll get back to you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Of course. I, I, I can't let um, uh, my comrade who spoke about domestic workers go unresponded to Thank because you. that is crucial. And also um, my other comrade who spoke. And um, saying when we speak with one voice, then we will win. That is true. And the difficulty of, um, I'm not telling you, comrade, anything you don't already know, as a domestic worker, but one of the difficulties of organizing people who work in such atomized ways, separately, like one individual in a household, one individual in a household, and so forth, is the difficulty of not having the kind of everyday community, which is a group of people that can turn into solidarity. There have been relatively successful efforts on the part of many different um, uh, groups of people, mostly women, working as domestic workers in various parts of the world. And I would be very happy, Comrade, to share some of their uh, contacts and stories with you. Uh, not to say, oh, it's this easy thing, I have the magic answer, but to say people actually have done this work um, for all the reasons that you said for every single reason that you said, whether it's somebody who is two hours from home raising somebody else's children, or half a planet from home raising somebody else's children. Um, these are crucial things. And then the last thing I want to say, and then, Comrade, you can close this out, is um, uh, Comrade Pato and I were talking the other night about the extent to which the police in, in this country are, I, mean, I would say, organized, and so we had a little uh, back and forth, and of course I yield to your um, uh, greater knowledge, but there is this force of co-conspiracy that must be uh, attended to at all times. And if the cop minister is the guy who's running the COVID response, we know that beneath that, there aren't a bunch of like indifferent cops sitting around twiddling their thumbs saying, oh, we'll work or we won't. They're excited about it. They're excited about it institutionally, even if not every individual is. So these are some of the problems that we see as the neoliberal state you know, continues to suck life out of people who will rise up. All right, sorry, I had to. And thank you, thank you. For Amanda. Uh, uh, for comrades who are visiting us for the first time, my name is Mwalila Tzaele. On behalf of the FORGE, Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and Pan-Africanism today, I thank you all for attending this important public talk and, dis and panel discussion. Once I thank you all, I offer particular thanks to Professor Ruth Wilson Gilmore for visiting us, for her brilliant presentation, on and, and for leading us in such meaningful, in such meaningful discussion. I would also like to recognize and express appreciation uh, 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 to Professor uh, uh, Wilson Gilmore's partner, who is also visiting. Thank you, Comrade Craig Gilmore, for being here with us. And uh, I would also like to thank our panelists' discussants for the brilliant presentations. My colleague and friend, Yvonne Phyllis. Thank you, thank you, Comrade. Uh, my friend of many years, Comrade Vashna. 
uh, and my comrade and leader. Thank you for, for <laughs> thank you for your for your presentation. And again, my comrade and friend of many years, Kelly. Thank you for your presentation. I just want to quickly mention that I think back in 2014, comrade uh, Kelly and comrade Leon Naidu um, visited us in, at the Steel Foundation. At the time, I was based at the Steel Foundation, and they visited us. And amongst the people that they were traveling with was. Uh, our esteemed comrade, comrade uh, Angela Davis, and by, by bringing comrade Angela Davis to the Steve Foundation in 2014, they made it possible for the Steve Foundation to invite Angela Davis to come to South Africa the following year, I think 2015, to deliver the Steve Memorial Lecture. So thank you, comrade, and thank you, comrade Kelly, for that. So, for, I'll never forget that. It's, yeah, thank you. So, so and. Uh, And I also want to express appreciation uh, to, our, to our friend, a friend of the forge and the commune, Maneo Mohari. Um, comrade, thank you for always, you know, collaborating with us. Thank you, Maneo. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Thank you for, for the brilliant facilitation. Uh, beautiful as always. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. So just uh, to quickly go back to Comrade Kelly. Comrade Kelly, thank you again for collaborating with us in making, you know, today a success and you know making today happen and i also uh, would like to thank my colleagues uh, uh, for working so hard to make sure that our program has been a success uh, I, will, I will not name them uh, but colleagues here at the forge and colleagues at, at the community conference today try continent that thank you all colleagues for making you know today a success and, and thank my leader here comrade richard thank you comrade richard for opening for us thank you and uh, I'm, I'm getting to the end. I would also like to thank. <laughs> I would also like to thank Joannis, uh, who has been dealing with the sound, and express our sincere uh, uh, thanks to the catering, uh, uh, to Tando for catering. Tando from T does the ports. Thank you, Tando. Uh, uh, please note tomorrow. Please note that tomorrow from 2:30 we will present a workshop for activists during which Professor uh, Gilmore will be in conversation with activists. The discussion will be facilitated by Comrade Vashna. So we are all welcome to attend. I wish you all a safe journey home. Thank you, Comrade Amanda. Yeah.